Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is New York Times bestselling fantasy writer, Raymond Feist. Raymond's latest novel is Master of Furies, book three of the Fire Main Saga. <laughs> Raymond, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your brand new novel, Master of Furies, how would you describe the novel? That's tough for a couple of reasons. First is the third act of a three-act play, basically. So it's the uh, end of a three-book series. And uh, the old model of you know drama is uh, act one, you chase your uh, protagonist up a tree. Act two, you throw rocks at him. And then act three, he comes down and f- wins the fight. Um, and to a large degree, that, that tends to be true for dramatic trilogies and three-act plays. Um, Master of Furies resolves uh, a massive conflict that engulfs uh, three characters. I tend to write character-driven stories that I just take interesting people and drop them in a whole world of hurt and uh, let them figure out how to get out of it. So I would say if you like magic and you like alien worlds and daring do, uh, the sort of things that I loved as a kid with pirates and jungle explorers that they don't do anymore uh, because you know, that was 50, 60 years ago. Um, it's that, that sense of wonder that fantasy allows you to have without asking too many questions, of course. And I would say that, uh, it would not be a happy place to jump in as a standalone book. Um, I have several jump in books as it were along my career, uh, but also, books that you don't want to start with. So I would say that uh, if you're interested in Master of Furies, they should start with King of Ashes, which is the first volume, and introduces all the characters and and gets you interested in who they are. Sure. And I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write the Fire Main Saga? Yeah, that's, you know, like one step away from a mental health check. Um, (laughs) You know how sometimes when you wake up, you, you don't come fully awake. You have that sort of moment of lucid dreaming where you kind of know you're a, a, asleep and dreaming, but you also sort of are, are still engaged in the process of the dream and the images and things. Well, moments in that dream state can be very, very vivid. And what I remember is waking up, literally waking up. And as I sort of opened my eyes and saw my bedroom, I, I heard a voice in my head. Uh, not not a character voice in a dream, but actually, you know, almost like I need to, you know, check for a transient ischemic attack or something because I I literally heard a voice saying, "Who's the King of Ashes?" And I sat there for a minute, made sure that all the other parts of me were working, heart still pumping. Yes, I can still wheel fingers and toes, and so it wasn't a stroke. Um. And then I thought, I have no idea where that came from, but damn, that's a good title for a book. (laughs) So I had a lot of false starts on this one. You could talk to my editor and and she would say the same. But finally, when I got the characters right, when I really understood who it was I was writing about, then pretty much everything else fell into place. And I had a task I set before myself, which was that – you know, the Rift War cycle is 30 books long, and most of it takes place on the world of Midkemia with, with a fair amount of action in a couple of other places, uh, the Dasadi world and in Kelawan. And when I uh, set out to do Garn, I forgot what a task world building can be. So that sort of set me back a pace. But finally got King of Ashes done, and I liked what was going on, and I started writing the second book, which at that point was untitled. But early in King of Ashes, I came up in a situation where, again, I had another one of those dreams, though it wasn't the voice in the ear kind of thing, but more just a sense of of something as I woke up. And that was, Hava wants to be a pirate. And suddenly I'm going, what, she wants to be Captain Jack Sparrow? (laughs) You know, and I played with that idea and I thought, okay, you know, we could have fun with that. And it sort of took over. And Hava became one of the preeminent characters in the second book, Queen of Storms. And Hava became a pirate. And it worked brilliantly, I think. I really turned into one of my best characters ever. Uh, My daughter's favorite character in the series, uh, Hava. And then that led to a fairly 
logical culmination in King uh, Master of Furies. The other major character uh, characters are Hattusile, who's who's the the fire man. He's the King of Ashes scion, who inherits what people think is a curse, but it's actually other something else. And Declan, who's a smith, who turns out to be a very important character in the history of this uh, area of that world. And uh, other than that would be spoilers. So I'm going to stay away from those. <laughs> well, I wonder if we could go back for a moment and, and talk about what was your initial writing journey that led you to sit down and write and get your first novel published? Were you well, someone who was writing when you were five? Or, oh, or? hell no. I could barely use crayons when I was five. <laughs> um, I, I, ha- I was born with what they call binocular dysfunction, which means my I send slightly different speed messages to my brain. Um, so think dyslexia when I tell you about my problems learning to read and write. Um, I had a really good teacher in the third grade who kept me in a reading circle while other kids were going to recess for a while. And there was a breakthrough. And later on, I discovered I was in college when I discovered I had this problem because it had been undiagnosed when I was a child. And I, uh, your, your brain learns to accommodate. It, it's amazing how the human brain can really deal with crap. And, and, you know, ask anybody who's had a major injury and had to relearn things. And it's, it's, it's a question of hard work. In my case, being a kid, I, I had no idea how hard work is. The brain was doing what it needed to do, and I learned how to read. And I became a very good reader. Still couldn't write like forever. I had, you know, many teachers say, you have such potential. You know, why are, <laughs> why are you getting Ds and Fs on your papers? Because I couldn't write. Um, I actually overcame that by learning to touch type. Because instead of trying to replicate the funny-looking letters that I saw, I was simply assigning finger movement to it. So suddenly I could write. And then I started getting really good grades in college. And I went, okay, well, I can, you know, and I got to the point where I was writing term papers rather than taking finals if I had a choice. And I graduated cum laude from University of California, San Diego, and had no idea what to do next, except I had a degree in mass market and public opinion. So I went into polling and I'd done volunteer work in politics for a number of years. But I got really tired of the political landscape and went to work for a nonprofit. And we had a big tax revolt in California called Prop 13, and all Mm -hmm. my funding went away. And suddenly I was out of work with a lot of other people out of work. And there was a thing that's very similar to some of the things we've seen lately, which was that people with better degrees and experience than I had were looking for the same job. So while all that was going on, I had started dabbling with an idea for a book. And... Let me backtrack a little bit. While in college, I got involved with a bunch of gamers, and I used to hang out with them mostly for the kind of social stuff. You know, it's uh, uh, I I was a returning student. I had to drop out of college for a number of years after my father died. And so when I went back to college, I was 27. Mm -hmm. And hanging out with, you know, a bunch of 17, 18, and 19-year-olds isn't exactly a day at the beach, um, unless you're a 17, 18, or 19-year-old. And well, you know, the girls were pretty and the boys were good athletes and we could have fun doing certain things. After a while, it's been there, done that. So I gravitated towards the graduate students. So most of my friends at that point were, uh, you know, in their 20s. And, you know, I was the oldest in the group, but not by much. But they had this game called the Game of Mechemia. And they were playing this role, role-playing game. And I had no idea what these people were doing. But I got caught up in it because I liked the company. And it was the social thing most of all that I liked. Also, tabletop gaming is an incredibly cheap pastime for a starving student. Mm -hmm. All you need are some funny-looking dice and pencils and paper. And, you know, some maps people would drop and things. So I got really immersed in that world. So when I decided to write my first book, um, as I said, I used to read Boys Adventure Fantasy when I was a kid. And there was no market for that. So you drop a dragon and a wizard in there, suddenly there's a market. So I chose fantasy as sort of a logical extension of of my reading interests, which were historical fiction and biography and boys' adventures fiction. So I couldn't do Robert Louis Stevenson, but I could do, you know, Hava Wants to Be a Pirate. Uh, I, I couldn't do, you know, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, but I could do, you know, guys in a lost tomb in an alien world. And that was fun stuff. And I had no idea what I was doing. So I wrote 
magician primarily because I was looking for work and writing fills up your day. If you enjoy writing, you can blow an entire day without blinking. <laughs> so I went through that process. I finished magician because of family connections. My father having been a producer, director, writer in Hollywood, I got in touch with a very, very fine literary agent in New York named Hal Matson, Harold Matson Company. And he agreed to represent the magician, got it to an editor at Doubleday named Adrian Zakheim. And Adrian, it was a big manuscript. So I got a phone call saying uh, from my agent saying, Adrian wants to talk to you about this book. I went, okay. But he has strong editorial ideas. And my first thought was he wants me to cut stuff because it's a big manuscript. To my surprise, he called and said, it's a great big book, Feist, but we think it could be bigger. And I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, peeling myself off the ceiling, he gave me a shopping list and he said, okay, here are things I want to see. And it took me about three days to write up a pitch. And I mailed it back. I'm, by the way, this was before email, guys. This yeah. was before. <laughs> so I, one of my friends a, in the gaming group got his few, first computer, which was a, an Apple II. Not even a Plus, just a two with the tape, you know, the tape recorder, yeah. data <laughs> feed and all that stuff. Um, didn't it, we had to get a uh, a pay more adapter and solder in to get upper and lower case? <laughs> you know, it was all, you know, I mean, some of the things that Steve Jobs did is surprising how that company survived early on. But we discussed the ideas I had. And I sent him the pitch, and he said, "Great." So I spent about three weeks writing first draft, and then another month and a half uh, rewriting. So about two months after he had called me, I sent the revised manuscript. And about a week and a half, two weeks later, I got a call and he said, great, this is exactly the book I want. Now cut 50,000 words out of it. <laughs> so after I cursed him unto the last generation of his line, you know, I got up off the floor and I, I cut a bunch of stuff. What I didn't realize at the time was I just got like a five-year writing careers education in three and a half months. That's and great. it was brilliant because I look back now and realize I learned so much about how to be a writer through those two guys, through Hal Matson and, and Adrian Zakheim, that I wouldn't be here for them if it wasn't for them. And, um, and I'm still thinking I'm looking for a job, but now I have a second career, writing. Well, <laughs> in a sense, I'm still looking for a job. <laughs> Well, you, you talked earlier when you were, when you were talking about the, the first, um, novel in this latest trilogy, and you said it took you a couple of tries to, to kind of figure out the characters. I, I'm curious, what is your writing process when you're working on, um, a novel? Are you someone who does a lot of outlining? Or? No, I am so bad at discipline when it comes to, you know, I, I, the one thing I insist on, and when I do talk to wannabe writers, I, I make this point. You got to know where it starts, but you damn well have to know where it's going to stop. Because if you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up like Moses wandering through the wilderness for 40 years. Um, but if you know where it's going to end, sometimes how you get there is the adventure. And that makes it fun. Because my characters often just do not listen to me. <laughs> they, they say, okay, you just think we're going over here and doing this, but actually we're going over here and doing that. And I've had characters show up who wouldn't go away, like Jimmy the Hand and Nacor the Isolani. You know, Nacor was supposed to be like a chapter or two of comedic relief. And he stuck around through the entire book of uh, Prince of the Blood. And then he shows up again in my next book. I go, okay, you little bastard. <laughs> he ended up being one of my most popular characters among readers. The same thing with Jimmy the Hand. You know, I, he was originally in one scene in the first draft of Magician. And when Adrian called me and said, we want more stuff about what's going on in the war back in leukemia while Pug is in Kelowan, I went, okay. So I did this chapter where Arutha goes to Krondor to find help from Prince Erland, and Jimmy shows up as being his conduit from running from the bad guys who are looking for him to meeting the, uh, the mockers, the Thieves' Guild. And, and the smugglers, and also meeting Princess Anita, who the smugglers are hiding and trying to get out of the city. So sometimes I'm convinced my subconscious is smarter than my conscious. So I trust my gut on a lot of this stuff. And as I said, getting there is half the fun. Because to me, 
a lot of the surprises are delightful. And also, you know, they put big erasers on pencils for a reason. So if I get halfway someplace and don't like it, I just delete, delete, delete. That's my process. So are you working on another novel now? Of course. I've got kids. And they still want money. Um, <laughs> no, you know, there, there's an old saying that I like, which is that, you know, old writers don't retire. We just drop dead one day. Um, okay, that's not true. Robert Silverberg's retired twice and come out of retirement twice. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but no, it's just too much fun. You know, it keeps the brain going. You know, uh, my mother, unfortunately, had a rough last four and a half years mm -hmm. uh, with dementia. And, you know, my my doctor along the way had mentioned, he said, look, as long as you keep writing, you really reduce the chance of that. Because as you're creating stuff, your brain is forming new, new neural pathways. And uh, assuming I don't stroke out from high blood pressure or, you know, drop dead from a heart attack or something. Um, I plan on doing this as long as I can because it is fun. And I mean, you can only watch so much bench television, right? True. Hey, this is Jeff, host of the podcast. You know, sometimes it seems like there's just an infinite amount of information out there. And that's exactly why I love Wondrium. Wondrium is a streaming platform that offers thousands of programs and documentaries from respected experts who really know their stuff. And for the listeners of this podcast, Wondrium has a wide selection of writing resources, how to write best-selling fiction, how to publish your book, writing creative nonfiction, every day is a poem, how to create comics, and much, much more. And the best part, you can watch or listen anytime, anywhere with the Wondrium app. Download and watch or listen on the go. Explore all of your wonders with Wondrium, and your brain will love it. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash B-O-O-K-S. Again, sign up today at wondrium.com slash books to get unlimited access with a 14-day free trial. Give it a try. So so given all of your experience, you said 30 novels, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories or novels? Well, I have two things that I say because I, I, I go to I, I don't do much of this anymore, but I used to go to a lot of conferences and things where Mm -hmm. All the eager young wannabes would be sitting in the front row. My my readers who just wanted to hear me run my mouth were sitting in the rest of the room. But all the wannabe writers were in the first row or two. And back in the day, they'd be sitting with pencil poised over, you know, pad, pad of paper or whatever. Now they have their PDAs out or their laptops. And they're waiting for me to open the magic box and show them the secret of writing. Hate to tell you, folks, there ain't no secret. Um what you do is you put your butt in a chair and you put your fingers on the keyboard and you keep working until you get where you want to go. If you quit, you're not a writer. Um, true story. The first science fiction writer I met who wasn't a friend of my father's because of the, you know, film thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, I met several really good, you know, Carrie Wilbur was a good family friend. He's the guy who wrote the, the, uh, you know, the space seat for Star Trek, you know, which introduced, you know, Noonan Singh Khan to, to the Star Trek universe. And I think all things considered, I will divide it to guys I read and guys I just knew because they had hung out and drank with my father. So among guys I read, Theodore Sturgeon showed up at UCSD when I was there. And I got invited because the guy who was, who was conducting the class was a buddy of mine. And he said, oh, Ted Sturgeon's coming in to give a lecture. I said, love his stuff, man. Yeah, he put his unicorn is one of the best collections of short stories ever. So I went there, and then I got invited to dinner with him and some other people. And we went up to, uh, what was it, uh, La Costa. You know, we went to the, the the country club restaurant there on the golf course. And um, at some point, I don't know why, I said to him, I said, well, I'm thinking you're writing something. And Ted said, oh, wait a minute. Please don't. Spare yourself. Writing is a lifetime of suffering and rejection and self-doubt. 
and you'll just find something else. You'll be much happier. So we fast forward to me walking around a convention up in the Bay Area with my first copy of Magician clutched in my hand because I knew Ted was a guest of honor. And I inscribed it to him. And I found him walking by the pool at the hotel. <clears throat> and I said, I, you may not remember me, but we had, I was in that group that had dinner with you in, in San Diego. And he said, oh, yeah. I said, remember when you told me not to be a writer? And then I handed him Magician. And he looked at me, and he opened it and saw the dedication, and he smiled. And he said, I tell everybody that. The writers never listen. <laughs> and that's my advice. You know, uh, also, one other hint. You're going to have two beings in your brain when you stay out. You're going to have a writer and an editor. Take the editor and say, okay, go ahead and get a beer. I don't need you right now. I will call you back when I need you, and then I'll really need you. But for the moment, get out of my house and mentally – Sit down and write, and don't try to write that perfect first line. You know, writing is rewriting. Uh, I've had okay. I had a couple of scenes in Fairy Tale that I probably wrote more than twenty times. I've had other stuff that first draft home run. You never know until you write it. So first, just put the damn story down, get it written, then go back and make it better. That's good advice. So what books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Well, I don't read a lot of fiction uh, mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. Or even First nonfiction. First almost because I, I, I don't want to be rewriting somebody else's stuff and go, oh, wait a minute, I write really bad George Martin. Yeah. But he writes really bad Feist, so there you go. Um, so I stopped, with a few exceptions, I stopped reading other people's fantasy and then mostly other people's fiction just for that reason a number of years ago. I mostly read biography and uh, – um, occasional politics and crime novels, but bi biography and, and I, there's one book I actually read about three years ago, but, which I keep recommending because I think it's freaking brilliant. And it's called Will in the World, How Shakespeare Became Shakespeare uh, by Steve Gombeck. And it's, 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 if you like, if you're interested in the history of Shakespeare and a different approach to biography, it's really a fine book because it goes into induction rather than deduction about certain things, you know, like the lost years, so-called lost years makes a good point. You know, he makes a good point that, that maybe what Shakespeare was doing was actually tutoring the children of Catholic nobles, which you kept on the down low during, you know, the reign of Elizabeth, that kind of thing. It's a wonderful book. And then, uh, a wind across the sea, which is a lovely book about the Napoleonic war at sea. And then I got some old favorites that I occasionally revisit. Like I'm about, when, if ever I get the time, I'm about, I really want to revisit uh, Thomas Costain's uh, three books on the Plantagenets, uh, which, which is probably the best single history. He was both a historical novel writer and a historian. And I, I, I heartily recommend anything with the name Thomas Costain on it. His better known stuff are The Silver Chalice, which they made a horrible movie starring Paul Newman out of. Uh, and The Black Rose, which was an okay movie starring Tyrone Power and Orson Welles. And my favorite of his is probably The Money Man, where he's – The Money Man was an influence for my book, uh, Rise of a Merchant Prince, about, okay, we got this war going. Who's paying for all this stuff? <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. I love George Martin, and I love the production they did of, um, of uh, Game of Thrones on TV. But there's one scene I'm sitting there, I'm realizing one of the profound differences between George and me or myself and a lot of other story uh, storytellers is he's got that bit where, uh, you know, who is a Rob Stark, I guess, sends a fake army to the north and lures the Lannisters out. And, and there's a scene where, you know, um, Charles Dance's character, you know, Tyrion's father, whose name I can't right. remember at the moment, mm -hmm. is talking about, we got lured and the sucker punch. And they're showing the, the decamped army of the Lannisters, you know, like hundreds of tents. But I don't see any camp followers. <laughs> I, you know, like, okay, who's, who's cooking for all these people? Who's taking away the trash? Where are the slit trenches? In other words, my life in college with compulsive type A war gamers, <laughs> you know, as friends, had made me very aware of the fact that, yeah, the real world demands. Often, armies had twice as many camp followers as they right, had soldiers. Right. You know, and and often the 
noble did not provide food. You know, the 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 his vassals were supposed to come out and take care of that, and they were some of them were cheapskates. So it, the soldiers were like going into the camps and finding cooks and ordering meals. You know, the early part of takeout, um, that kind of stuff. So occasionally, I got caught up in that a little bit, and and really like, but that I think is one of the strengths of my writing. Actually, is that as wacky as a world as Midkemia or Garn or Kelowan or the Dasadi world can be, it sort of makes sense to the reader because they go to the bathroom and they have to eat, and you know they get into fights over who ate the last cookie and that sort of thing. <laughs> That's great. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels and your latest novel, Master of Furies? Well, I have a website, uh, crydee.com, C-R-Y-D-E-E, -E, which is a little bit more of a um, archive than it is an active base. Uh, I'm most active on Facebook because I'm old. I remember when Facebook was the new thing and nobody was going to MySpace anymore. So that shows you how fast social media evolves. Frankly, TikTok scares me because I can't dance. Um, <laughs> and I've been told by my daughter, just don't even think about Reddit. Um, but so basically Facebook, I, I, I do post information on Twitter. But Facebook is kind of my uh, base. I have two pages there. If you don't want to hear me yap about politics, sports teams, and whiskey, my pro page is better than my personal page. My personal page is for people who want to put it with my nonsense. My pro page is where I engage with people about my writing. And it's it's just look for Raymond D. Feist on Facebook, and it'll show you two pages. Pick the one where I actually am wearing a jacket, where the one where I'm wearing a T-shirt sitting in front of a sign that's a San Diego Comic-Con, that's me mouthing off about why, you know, scotch is better than bourbon and things like that. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with New York Times bestselling author Raymond Feist. His latest novel is Master of Furies, book three of the Firemain saga. The novel has just been released, so go buy a copy. And Raymond, thanks for doing this interview. Hey, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Toachipe, the hour marker of Arcana, struck the marble floor twice, and the door guards opened the massive, ornately carved portal to the camera, allowing entrance to the Lord of the Golden Pride. The hour marker stepped aside as Tarquin entered ahead of the four leaders of the other most powerful prides in Naitani. As was customary, the leader of the lesser prides stood to either side of the entrance, each resigned to their lower station or secretly plotting how they might one day be part of the procession. As was his habit, Tuachipe surveyed the group quickly, compiling a mental tally of who was in the capital. His duties comprised more than marking the passage of time. He was also a chronicler of every detail of governance, for one never knew which small element might prove critical in the future. Accountability and blame were vital to surviving in his office. The Pride Lords entered in specific order, a tacit agreement as to their influence and power. Much of the governance of Naitani came down to unspoken tradition, conventions created from centuries of living under constant threat from the Dark Masters. Centuries of living just moments away from inconceivable retribution for any transgression had created a ritual observance of social norms to become hardened into inflexible institutions. All were designed to reduce conflict among the families and prides, despite the myriad of murderous feuds and rivalries that had endured between them for generations. Toachipe's office was one of many that had evolved over this time to ensure that this brittle peace stayed in place. Toachipe's primary virtue was patience, as it had been for his predecessors. The only name for his duties was tedium. Yet with that tedium came privilege, and few outside the prides could claim such advantage. The nations were allowed only as much or little bounty as the prides above them were allowed, and only office holders like Toachipe were free from such control. Occasionally he wondered who the first hour marker had been, 
and how he had contrived that station. Toachipe was ignorant of this fact because, while there were records of every order of business going back to the farthest memory of any ancestor, the study of such history was forbidden to him, despite his office. Urias, the lord of the Tiger Pride, followed Tarquin, and behind him came Miascomi, the lord of the Onyx Pride, Jacanda of the Eagle Pride, and Shono of the Jaguar Pride, each in turn peeling off to right and left until the five most powerful men in the nation had taken their appointed seats. Following them were the five recorders, women blessed with a remarkable ability to retain details, each responsible for transcribing every word their own specific lord uttered. They operated under seal of death, not just their own, but that of their entire families, should one word of what they recorded be uttered outside the camera. Collective punishment was assumed among the people of Naitani. It was part of the rigid code that kept the peace under the eyes of the Dark Masters. Last to enter was the first speaker, the one man not of the ruling class trusted to hear all that was said and whose sole role it was to act as chief arbitrator. Following tradition, he paused for a moment and turned to face the hour marker, indicating that it was time to shut the doors. From the moment the sound of the closing portal stopped reverberating, only those within this room would know what was discussed. The population would learn what had been concluded by whatever edicts emerged from the camera. All the deliberations, debates, arguments and occasionally threats that were spoken within were closely guarded secrets. 